Right, so we're now recording. Hi everyone, this is Friday Forecasting Talks and today we have a fascinating talk by Thanos Golsos. Um, oh, Thanos will introduce himself uh, so that I don't have to. Um, but before we, we do that, so before we start the talk, I'll had, uh, I, I wanted to say a couple of words about the center as usual. So we are the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting of Lancaster University. Uh, specifically management school and we provide a variety of services including bespoke short courses where we help companies we train teams uh, in areas of forecasting in inventory management or marketing analytics we provide consultancy depending on the needs of companies uh, help in software development uh, and have a variety of projects including PhD research projects where a student comes to company and does something substantial and innovative or knowledge transfer partnerships when student or not a student a professional supported by us comes and uh, implements the state-of-the-art approaches. Uh, we have expertise in marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting, machine learning and so on and so forth and this is these are the pictures of our team members we are spread across two departments, uh, management science and uh, maths and stats department. So you can see some of our colleagues from maths and stats here as well. Um, you, if you want, you can get in touch with us. You can follow us on LinkedIn, contact us directly using this email address. Uh, we have our own website, which is going through some changes. So hopefully in the new year, you will see a glorious, amazing new website of the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And we have our YouTube channel, which we plan to develop further, introducing educational videos. So starting from the new year, we will have new materials there. And finally, last but not least, we have a page for Friday Forecasting Talks these events and where you can see what uh, will happen next. So that's it from me. Let's uh, start our talk and uh, over to you, Thanos. You can start sharing your screen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ivan uh, and uh, Robert and uh, John for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name is Thanos Goltsos. I'm uh, the Park Assistant Professor of Manufacturing and Logistics in Cardiff Business School. I'm also the secretary for the UK chapter of the IAF. And uh, I work in forecasting inventory control, simulation, optimization, and I apply these tool sets uh, and uh, methods in the sec in secular economic operations. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, this uh, issue, these issues today, the role and challenges of forecasting for uh, circular economic operations. Uh, this is the overview. I'm going to start with a fairly brief um, um discussion about what is the circular economy i'm very sure uh most of uh, the audience would be uh knowledgeable about or would know what the circular economy is but i want to highlight a few issues and how these issues interact with operations management and forecasting in particular then i'm going to talk about forecasting for circular economic operations uh, which is one of the tools um, uh, that can help us uh, deal with the extra uncertainties that come from closing the loop and turning linear into a circular uh the linear supply chains into circular supply chains, and then how we could measure performance uh, for circular economic operations. Uh, I have some results for prior research I will show. So the circular economy then definition, strategies, and implications. Uh, we start the traditional uh, open loop uh, linear supply chain. So we have we go from resource extraction, manufacturing, distribution, usage by customers, and then uh, all these uh, items traditionally ended up in the landfill. Obviously, that is not uh, ideal. Um, a, a, a way to treat this is to close the loop. So go from the, the linear uh, supply chain to the circular supply chain. So we try to uh, re reduce resource, resource extraction, reduce uh, waste ending in the landfill, and by collection of uh, the items at the end of uh, use rather than the end of life, we we have a, a range of activities or strategies, circular economic strategies that we can um, adopt and then either keep the items as a product, uh, repair them, remanufacture them, refurbish them and redistribute them, or we can extract parts uh, we can use in the manufacturing or re uh, repurposing or as a 
as the least preferred option, uh, just recycle them and turn them back into uh, new resources or renewed resources that they can be uh, fed back into the system. Uh, very briefly, again, uh, an uh, uh, definition of the circular economy. The circular economy is an alternative to the traditional linear economy, make, use, dispose, in which we keep resources in use for as much as possible, extract the maximum value from them whilst they are in use, and then recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of its service life. And one of the main things here is that we talk about the uh, end of its service life rather than talking about the end of life of a product. Uh, there is a range of uh, options or um, a grouping of different operations that uh, have uh, a different effect or, um, or a different uh, value retention. So we've, I've, we've grouped them now in two categories, two broad categories. One is uh, the, the, the strategies that are intended to extend the lifespan of products and its parts. So we have reuse, repair, refurbish, the manufacture and repurpose. And then we have uh, some uh, other strategies that are useful applications for the materials and then mainly recycling but also energy recovery as the uh, least option. I've tried here to put these strategies uh, and juxtapose them with the linear uh, operations. So uh, resource extraction, primary proce processing, manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, and usage, and then ended up landfill that with the linear supply chain. And then the strategies, uh, circular economic strategies, some of them can work uh, before the inception, even the inception of the project, so, so the product, so at the design stage, so we have refuse uh, to abandon products that maybe that we don't need anymore, we think, uh, which is basically optimization and intensification of the product use and the, and the way we produce it, or reducing altogether by increasing efficiencies um, in the production or the distribution or the usage of the, of the items. Uh, but in terms of operational management, I think uh, the ones here at the bottom are more um, uh, pertinent. So uh, we have, of course, product reuse where items can go from one customer to another, but then we can have a repair and then back to the customer or refurbish, refurbishment and distribute it back to customers, reman uh, remanufacturing to serve the demand that the same, the same demand that the new product would, uh, would serve, repurposing. So we, we take um, uh, parts or products that have reached their useful uh, end of life or end of use for a primary application and find a different application for them. Uh, recycling, where we just extract the materials and then there's a recovery. And this fit into these different stages of the, of the, of the supply chain. Uh, the important thing here is that as we go from right to left, we have uh, less and less value retention. And we can think of it uh, in, in, in such a way that from repair to refurbishment to, re to remanufacturing, and then somewhere in the middle of repurposing, we have a diminishing value of the product. And then when we move from uh, into recycling and energy recovery, we have no value, no remaining value of the product, no engineering value remains. Uh, all the value then is in the materials. And of course, you can see that you can understand that going from right to left, um, it's it's least preferable. So we, we would like to keep it as much as possible on the right. Of course, this is not always possible. Um, I, I have an example here uh, about the quality. I will very, very, very quickly mention this. Uh, and the difference between manufacturing, manufacturing new products and remanufacturing. Um, for manufacturing, we have a bill of materials, which is essentially a recipe for a product. So uh, we would know to make a bicycle, we would need two, uh, two wheels, a frame, etc. And then if we want to make 10 bicycles, we just multiply that by 10, and we know exactly what we need to order and when to create these 10 bicycles. But uh, in terms of uh, remanufacturing, so if we, if we were to remanufacture 10, 10 bicycles, we would not be sure how many uh, wheels we could uh, we would need because some of them would be in a good condition that they would be reusable or the frame most of the frames maybe they are usable so maybe for 10 bicycles we need one frame my new frame and we can reuse nine of them um, so so there's an extra layer of uncertainty that comes from this closing of the loop as our um, as our um, um, customers essentially become our uh, suppliers and the other thing I want to uh, mention here, and this, the bill of materials and the bicycle example uh, maybe is helpful here to uh, explain this, is that there is not, no need for a singular um, um, circular economic treatment, or maybe it's not even possible. So it's not uh, the case that the company would say, okay, I will start remanufacturing my products and that's it, or I will start recycling and that's it. And um, so, for, so for so for the bicycle, whether there's a four four optional four options for circular economic treatment, and for different parts of it, 
might be a different set of options as well. And uh, for a, for a product to go from a linear supply chain or a company to go for a, from a linear supply chain to a circular supply chain, they would need to think about which uh, which ideal mix of circular economic, uh, circular economic operations is to pursue based on a product by product and supply chain to supply chain uh, basis. Um, but importantly, also most of the techniques, especially in the area of forecasting, would be shared between all different circular circular economic strategies. So forecasting the returns. Uh, is pertinent to any and regardless of which specific circular economic strategy a company or supply chain is pursuing. Now, uh, if we take a look at, at this, uh, and, and this I will, I will basically uh, wind down my my discussion of the circular economy. If we take a look at the or we take the perspective of the product life cycle, we will have the traditional introduction, growth, maturity, decline, and then perhaps death. Um, in the gray on the on the dark gray scale, uh, gray. Um, um, life cycle, we have the demand, so the demand for new products. Here you have a volume, number of items, and here we have time. So we introduce the product, we start selling it, early adopters uh, buy it, we go into the growth phase, and at some point in time, we will start seeing returns. Um, in, in general, here in my presentation, in circular economy in general, we don't talk about returns that people they just didn't want to buy something and they just change their minds. We're talking about some something's wrong with it or they just don't want to use it anymore. So there is the returns will start uh, uh, will start coming back uh, with a time lag from the demand. Obviously you need to have a, an item sold to have it returned in this sense. And over this time we can have different um, circular economic treatment opportunities, let's say so we have uh, let's call them. So we have uh, Repair, uh, refurbishment, and manufacture. Of course, you'll have to have repairs. Could be warranty repairs. Um, they can start uh, as early as 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 you may want to draw draw this drag this line to the left. But refurbishing and manufacturing will start a bit later. May perhaps you need some accumulation of, of items as well. But in any case, once these operations start, then your total demand can be met by a mix of original equipment manufacturing and some remanufacturing or refer refurbishment of of returns. Um, how uh, high the uh, the distribution of returns is, or this the, the the return life cycle, let's call it, depends on the probability of eventual return. So, what percentage of your sold items do you expect to see uh, coming back? Uh, you can imagine in a in a leasing scenario, this could be close to uh, the, well, the areas under these two lines would be uh, perhaps equal, and this would be a bit higher. Uh, we have examples. Uh, we have a recent project uh, on, re on on repurposing, and we found out that for um, per, uh, for carpet tiles, that that percentage is like five percent at the moment. So for leasing, you could expect a hundred percent probability of better return or something close to that. For carpet tiles, that would be around five percent. And then, how far away the peaks are or their their means in general, how much um, lagged. The returns are depend on the average time to return, which can be seen as the average uh, time of use an item has with their, with the customers. And here I've uh, so on the top here are the volume uh, and the time, and on the bottom here I have uh, uh, answered. Uh, it's not ideal, but I put another vector here, the vector of quality. And what I want to stress here is that um, as the as we move through the product life cycle. Um, the circular treatments can be uh, informed, or the optional, the, the optimal circular treatment can be informed by two variables: the variable of time, especially uh, compared with the average demand during that time frame, but also the quality of the individual returns. So there are two important points in time here um, uh, in our current understanding. Uh, one is when these two lines intersect, <coughs> and that can theoretically mean that. We do not need to uh, continue OEM production. We don't need to create any new items. The entirety of our demand can be uh, met by our uh, remanufacturing or refurbishment or repair of our returns. Uh, obviously, any surplus returns, uh, anything above this line, we don't need to um, uh, remanufacture because there's no demand for it. So something else needs to be found to, to, to be done with it. And then the other important point is when the demand dies, up, dies down, and again, um, from a time perspective, repair, refurbishment, and manufacturing do not, do not make any sense anymore. 
because there is no actual demand for the product. So based on the on where you are on the product life cycle, uh, you have a subset of options that are preferable. Some of them may not even be uh, doable, but also there's the, the uh, vector of quality, basically the condition of the returned items, or in another way to see it, how easy it is to bring it to an as good as new condition to repair, refurbishment, or remanufacture. And if it's not uh, it's easy at all, maybe if you need to do repurposing or recycling on it. Um, but still, uh, the forecast of returns need to happen uh, regardless of any of these uh, considerations. Um, we have then the forecast for the demand, of course, the forecast for returns, but we also have the forecast for the net demand. And the net demand is, of course, demand minus returns. So basically, uh, the, the difference between uh, these two lines, these are the net demands. And here in this area, we have positive net demand. And here in this area, we have negative uh, net demand. And this has implications. I will, I will talk to about these uh, a bit further on. So there's three way, main ways to manage these extra uncertainties. Um, for circular economic operations, I've highlighted the ones that I'm going to be touching upon. So we try to estimate the rates, so the time and quantity, uh, but also the quality of demand returns and the, and the net demand. Uh, quality is important, but uh, I, I'm going to mention it, but I'm not going to uh, expand on it uh, at this time. So beyond forecasting, we can try to influence the collection process, so we can give incentives for for uh, for uh, people returning their products. We can also give different um, uh, monetary incentives based on the condition of the returned products. So for instance, um, uh, I think it was Carphone Warehouse, they would give different price for a returned phone if it could turn on or not based on that. So try to influence the time, the, uh, the, the quantity and the quality of the returns. And then we can also manage it once we once it has received in our inventories by employing pre-sorting um, and classification of the returns based on the quality. OK, then, so how can we forecast uh, for circular economic operations? Forecasting the rate of return and how that can be translated into forecast is forecasts of net demand and where these forecasts can be used. So here I have a manufacturing supply chain from one of our projects. We have a serviceable inventory which serves the demand. So items go to the customers. Eventually they get returned. They sit in an inventory, of course. And they go through the process of assessment, repair and testing. There is a spare part inventory for uh, parts, a spare part inventory. So there's a forward loop from returned products to serving demand, a reverse loop uh, for the products in service to return to our to our premises. There is some losses from the consumption, but also at the assessment stage. And there is opportunities for replenishment either by a core broker. Cores are basically the returned items. Core broker would be someone who is um, collecting them and selling them on to the manufacturers or OEM production directly at the serviceables to serve the excess demand that uh, we, we will have to eventually have based on the losses, the exits of the system. Of course, there's also sp spare parts suppliers uh, that can be sold directly to the, co to the consumers or to uh, for our manufacturing uh, um, operations. And this is how the uh, forecasts uh, fit into this supply chain. So we forecast the uh, demand of the consumers, we forecast their returns. But in order to place orders for the core brokers or the OEMs, we need the forecasts of net demand. So basically, demand minus returns, the surplus demand that cannot be met by uh, returns. And this is just a different representation, more simplified. We have uh, inventory, of course, which is remanufactured in serviceables, serving demand through demand forecasts, the return course, returns forecasting, and the net demand that um, needs to inform our orders to the broker. Similarly, for uh, OEM replenishment, same graph, just with OEM instead of a broker. Um, and now comes here comes like how how can we what are the ways we have available to us to forecast uh, what what information do we need and how do we use that information to forecast the returns? There are four ways to forecast returns. The simplest way to do it is just to um, ignore the fact that these are returns. Treat them treat it treat the return time series as any other time series, and uh, employ any any forecasting method that is fit for uh, for a demand. So the expression splitting family, ARIMA methods. Any 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 method that you could uh, apply for normal demand can be applied in this sense for returns. Uh, but of course, this disregards uh, the relationship between demand and returns. So here we have a very good explanatory variable basically for for the returns, and um, 
research and our, our research as well has shown that disregarding it, if you have it, disregarding it uh, is uh, leads, leads to un serious underperformance. Then there are three other methods that take into account in increasing uh, complexity, information uh, between the relationship of demand and returns. The first method, the simplest of the method that uh, that we have is basically to assume that every sale is accompanied by a return so that the, the sale and the return process happen simultaneously. Um, so any buyback scheme, uh, leasing again, uh, you can think of uh, 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 beer kegs in a pub that they order a new, they order a new beer keg and they would essentially at the same time get the empty one back or gas containers um, or any soda containers, things like that. Um, this method would be ideal for that. Obviously, that is a very small percentage of how um, the circular economy operates. So, OK, that's that. Then the second method is to relate to terms to past sales. Uh, so you can do some correlation analysis, take two, two time series and analyze how they behave one uh, next to the other. It's a more involved approach to investigate the obvious correlation between uh, returns and past sales. And then the third method, which requires uh, the, most, the most detailed data, is to track returns to past sales. So here we have serialized information. Every sale uh, based on, an, on a serial number, we know how when it was sold, how long it spent with the customer, when it was returned. Uh, it's very hard to get data, uh, but I guess as time goes by and as people engage more seriously in the circular economy, this data will become more and more available. So here we have serialized information, and we, we which a allows us to perfectly correlate uh, um, returns to past sales. So we can construct the empirical distribution or fit any distribution to that data. <coughs> but also importantly, to track uh, which items have returned and update the uh, a third distribution of to be returned items. So the methods M1, M2, and M3 depend on the characterization of the time to return distribution, which is then applied to past sales, but also critically at times at um, forecasted demand uh, to create forecasts of returns. Uh, based on the um, perhaps lead time for procurement and the time to return distribution, again, the time to return distribution is essentially uh, how long an item spends with a customer. So based on, the, on, on, on these two uh, variables, you may have uh, returns happening within your lead times. And in that sense, those would not originate for, from past sales, but rather from forecasted future sales. So if, you, if your uh, average time to return is two periods and your lead time is five, um, a demand that is, gonna, uh, is projected to happen in period one and two will still return within your lead time and needs to be accounted for. Now, beyond um, uh, the, the four ways we have to forecast returns, there is actually then five ways to forecast the net demand because uh, we can, of course, use any of these methods and deduct those forecasts from the forecast of demand and get the forecast of net demand. But we can also create the net demand time series and, and characterize or forecast uh, that directly. Obviously, uh, um, this is a bit problematic, but also an opportunity for, uh, for research. Uh, in the sense that net demand can be uh, positive, zero, or negative, and so can the, its forecasts. And of course, this uh, they would not have the they would not have the same sign all the time. So you can have positive uh, net demand but negative forecast net demand, vice versa, zeros everywhere. Also, very small numbers. So the net demand uh, can randomly or systematically be very close to zero if you have a high percent high high probability of returns, for instance. Uh, these problems on the on the denominator, not too dissimilar to the problems that we have met with intermittent demand forecasting, uh, characterization, and accuracy measurement. I will return to this uh, a bit in a bit. So um, I have some results. We've done a project with a, a manufacturer in the North Wales, a three-year project, including the two-year KDP. I was the associate for that KDP prior to my, my my current role. Uh, the company is a global defense and aerospace integrated logistics supplier. Uh, basically, they have a range of electric uh, night vision, thermal, and image enhancing visual aid equipment for dismounted soldiers or uh, gun mounted, and so and so forth. And there is a closed loop supply chain where they take care of them, manufacture them, and put them back, send them back out to the units of the barracks uh, for the UK MOD. The questions we had, and I'm so I'm going to show you some of the results here. 
uh, is how can we find for, uh, improvements in forecasting inventory performance? What's the effect of serialization? So the effect of going from uh, a simple forecast to M1, M2, and M3. Uh, what is uh, the effect of the demand forecasting in those for the forecasts of returns and the forecast of net demand? Uh, we've seen that in, in the past in the literature for, for good reasons. Um, most of the time, the demand forecasting aspect has been kind of sidestepped. They, assume, they have some very uh, convenient assumptions, so they could the, the, the prior research could not really uh, answer the questions of, of, of how important is actual the net demand, the forecast, the, the demand forecast in either the returns forecast or the net demand forecast. It's also worth noting that in, in our, our example here, um, I'll talk about it a bit about later as well, but we have very long times to return. So many of the return forecasts were based on demand forecasts, which kind of complicates things. And are there any inventory implications? The forecast utility over accuracy discussion that has been going on for some time. Do accuracy improvements uh, in returns then demand translated into inventory savings? <coughs> so the data set, um, the simulation, which took us a long time to do it, to clean the data was a was a actual nightmare. Because especially for for serial, the serialized data sets, to clean the data already clean demand data can be problematic sometimes. But trying to track on a serial on a serial number basis from transactions to time series was anyway hard. So we have the demand for uh, four to ele up to eleven years across fifteen equipment transactional data that include demand uh, of serviceable and manufactured uh, products, uh, used products returns linked with the issues at the serial number level, so timestamp transactions, any manufacturing dates at the serial number, distribution of failure tests, rates, costs and lead times, uh, which allowed us to um, assess inventory implications. And already we've seen that uh, both the demands and the return exhibit intermittent and lumpy behavior. Uh, we have 15 SKUs, 12 were slow moving or, or intermittent, three were fast moving. And I mean, this is some summer statistics for the data set. Uh, here we have for the demand on the top and the returns on the bottom. One thing that um, I didn't appreciate before this project and before looking at this data in, in detail was the fact that returns tend to be uh, less intermittent and more, um, more better behaved than demand. And you can see it already from the standard deviations. Uh, but basically, especially for this data set, having a long time to return meant that um any demand would be spread around many different periods as a return which eventually would lessen the intermittence and the variance of the returns time series as it gets diffused over long periods of time so the first uh, thing we we managed to do and this this was uh, it was not done before in the in the literature was to characterize the, the time to return distributions based on the um, basically how, how detailed our data sets were. So we fitted uh, a bunch of distributions to it. We found that beta, gamma, and finally uh, the negative binomial were the better fits. But overall, we decided that the beta is the best one in terms of fit and general applicability. So the, we have the average uh, mean absolute deviation here, or mean absolute error. And the total rank uh, is basically across the 15 SKUs. Uh, if, a, if, a, if a distribution performed best, we get one point. If it, per, if it performs second best, we get two points. And then across the 15 equipment, that is the total rank. OK, so the next step would be then to characterize the net demand time series. We can we can now say there is some understanding of what distributions the, um, well, of course, for our data set, uh, the, the, the returns would follow. But to characterize the net demand time series, which would be also uh, be, a, be very conductive for inventory applications, is something that is, um, at least in the supply chain context, not uh, explored. There's an exception of Keller and Silver, uh, which assumed double distributed demand returns and therefore net demand. So beyond the ab above, uh, the normal uh, net demand uh, assumption, the scale distribution could be a potential candidate, which is formed by the subtraction of two pass distributions. And again, especially for intermittent demand contexts, uh, that would be a good candidate. Of course, uh, in the scalar distribution, there's an assumption that the two uh, Poisson distributions are independent, which at first sight uh, is super problematic uh, because returns are, of course, dependent to past demands. However, uh, one can imagine, and again, this is something we want to test in the near future, 
uh, that all, long average length and high var variance of the time to return distribution might kind of relax this assumption or make, 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 make this assumption not being as, as important or as serious and can allow us to treat it as independent because of course current demand and returns may not be correlated or very weakly correlated based on the, the, the characteristics of the particular case. In terms of net demand forecasting, so the problems with it and when compared to normal, the traditional demand forecasting is basically that A, the returns constituent depends on past and at times within lead time demand. And these uh, these things can be uh, negative, positive, positive, negative or, or zero interchangeably as well. So uh, both the characterization and the forecasting is challenging and the measurement uh, problematic. And that's that's that. These are the main reasons that most of the research has focused on uh, on returns forecasting rather than on the net demand uh, all, all combined. So we conducted these tests with uh, the methods I mentioned, and uh, we we found some results. Again, this is our uh, setup. Um, I, I I I I discussed this setup earlier. Basically, here's the consumption goes out to different units, then comes back to the premises. There's some replenishment happening with core brokers. And there's a manufacturing operation. Going on, we used a simulation uh, based on the empirical data, data we had. We uh, restructured the inventory forecasting process. So we tested a forecasting accuracy and inventory control. Uh, we um, pinned the data in monthly buckets to uh, master the decision making process employed by the company, but also uh, it was just reasonable to, to also deal with uh, intermittency. And we used the data, data augmentation process where we cre created K new blocks of data. Uh, the K was uh, the blocks were equal to the initial time series size, length, and it constructed uh, based on bootstrapping the, the time series characteristics, issues, and times to return. Uh, we used the mean absolute scaled error to uh, uh, summarize some of the results. Uh, it was not always uh, useful or meaningful, or at least we did not have a, a very good understanding of how that could be employed. Uh, especially in net demand. Uh, for, so for some of the results, we present mean absolute errors, and we tested for statistical significance. I'm, I'm, I'm going through quite, quite quickly uh, as well in, in, in terms of it's not as 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 important as the results and time is limited. Um, so this is the effects of serialization. So we employed CES as the method that completely disregard the discards the relationship between demand and returns. And then M1, just as a reminder, assumes instantaneous demand and returns. M2, uh, uh, coupled with the beta assumption for the time to return distribution, and M3 based on the empirical data. We thought that this is the fairest uh, comparison because if you have the data for the M3, you don't really have to fit a distribution. You can use straight the empirical distribution, but for the M2, you would not have exactly this data. So we would uh, use a better representation of the time to return distribution. So, okay, of course, we found that serialization enables uh, the use of M3 and better characterization of the process. So, the other difference between these two methods, beyond um, the uh, granularity of the data they have available to them and the M3 being able to employ the actual empirical distribution, is that uh, the, the data that em enable M3 can also allow us to track the returns. So, if we know that five months ago we sold 10 items, the M3 understands that perhaps five of them have been returned, so there are only five remaining from that time period. But M2 does not, so M2 does not know where the returns, the returns come from. So for the M2, still ten are 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 pending from that uh, time bucket. I have a few slides in the end that explain this a little bit better, but um, I've hidden them. Uh, if 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 we want and there is time, maybe we can go over it, but it's not as important. So uh, we found that uh, these benefits are both for slow and fast moving items, which uh, raised the uh, the question of uh, investment in RFID technologies to automate the tracking and the serialization of the data. OK, now the next question uh, was, uh, what's the effect of correctly characterizing the time to return distribution? So what is a, how, how important is it to get this extra information? And what happens if you mischaracterize it? So we use now the M2 and the M3, but we used three different distributions based on the performance they had and the accuracy to, to, to how close they were to the empirical actual time return distribution. So the better representation we found 0.088 uh, MAD, 
the uh, beta, um, of course, the empirical would have zero. Uh, and the uniform has uh, 0 0.298. So we have the actual, a good representation and a bad representation. And we see that for the empirical, there is uh, the M3 is, does a little bit better. And this is basically down to the fact that it has uh, this ability to understand how many items are still pending for return, while the two does not. But uh, for the beta, which is a very good representation, still the M3 is, is better. But once we have a bad representation, sorry, bad, bad understanding of the time to return distribution, the M2 is uh, more robust and outperforms the M3. So um, it's less reactive, less sensitive to wrong, wrong characterization, and therefore is preferable um, in scenarios where you have very dynamic changes and so on and so forth. So there's a trade off between accuracy or, or potential, potential for accuracy and uh, robustness between these two methods. Now moving from returns to net demand forecasts, um, we've also broken this down to uh, all equipment, high volume and low volume. Again, three of the time series were high volume, 12 were low volume. I understand that 15 time series uh, are not a lot of time series. At the same time, I want to say that there were zero time series, especially for the um, data that uh, the, the transactional data that uh, that um, enabled the M3. There were zero time series up to that point in the literature, and that attests also how hard it is to get such data. But okay, this is what it is, three and twelve. So uh, here was the, the first the first time um, we really struggled with uh, selecting um, a forecasting accuracy measure, and this prompted us to think about what needs to be done in this uh, in this sense. So the mess is not appropriate. Uh, to compare at least between uh, lead time return forecast and net demand forecasts. It's not uh, immediately clear what you would have in the denominator for uh, the, the, uh, the lead time net demand forecasts, and therefore we opted for the mean absolute errors. And um, what we found here is basically that uh, the effect of, 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 of demand accuracy uh, is, is uh, at times dwarfing the effect of the returns accuracy. Uh, it's generally easier to focus returns once you have good data than to focus demand, of course, because you have an explanatory variable. In terms of forecast utility, um, I'm going to skip through this in uh, in, in minus time. We just found basically that the accuracy, the only the only control variable here was how accurate the return forecasts were. Then we go for the most accurate to a quite good accuracy to an average to kind of bad accuracy, but we see there's limited results, limited effects in terms of costs and at least service levels. And this is down to the fact that um, as the prior so slide showed, the accuracy of the demand forecast dwarfs the effect of the accuracy of the returns forecast. So serialization is beneficial in terms of forecast accuracy for both slow and fast moving items. So for slow items of high cost investment in time stacking technologies is, is obvious to, to, to capture these uh, benefits. Forward demand forecasting implications should not be ne neglected. Uh, because it affects the performance of within lead time returns forecasts, among other reasons, and it's equally important with returns forecasts. Uh, and this is basically uh, maybe it's it's uh, for this audience here is is um, uh, it just makes sense, but uh, prior literature basically neglected uh, the effect of uh, demand by making assumptions of, of basically knowing what the demand would be. Beta, gamma, and negative binomial distribution seems to be the good good fits, and. Uh, the, the benefits of serialization and utility are debatable. More research needs to be um, conducted in other setups. Um, there, are other, there are other supply chain setups that could be um, uh, investigated. So again, I have some more slides to discuss four different setups between the options of pull and push uh, as, as a setup for the returned items, but also between uh, uh, OEM and co-broker replenishment. But these are the four variables that can affect how uh, your replenishment happens and how you treat your returns. And also uh, different time to return distribution, different lead times, how, the, how those variables would affect uh, uh, inventory control. As is, perhaps this slides a bit more, a bit small. But uh, there's also big question marks around the, the forecast uh, accuracy measurement for net demand uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, beyond this characterization, that's also beneficial for inventory control. 
So, I mean, what distribution should we use to um, to uh, to calculate the safety stocks? So, for a normal demand, normal demand uh, of, of of products, we most often use normal uh, normal normality assumptions. Uh, here, I guess the most obvious candidate would be just use the empirical uh, distribution. But if you cannot construct it, how could you approximate it? This is an open question. But again, more specifically, for the accuracy measurement, the um, the net demand, the forecast, and the actual demand may not be symmetrically distributed, uh, may be close to or contain zeros, and can be negative. In that sense, at least some of these issues are are also uh, prevalent in intermittent uh, demand accuracy measurement, and create some problems with um, uh, measures that are based on absolute errors. Uh, the possibility of the negative values uh, affects uh, some other measures. Uh, so then, and there needs to be an, an, an investigation of, of of which measures are appropriate, which adaptations should be made to existing measures to make them appropriate, and so on for the um, for the uh, measurement of net demand uh, accuracy. And of course, then uh, going to utility, there is a big discussion. Uh, all, uh, most of you are, are aware, many of you are leading these discussions as well, uh, about how to measure uh, forecast utility. Forecasting is not a, a mean, an end in itself. It serves some other decision-making process most of the time. One of those decision processes that has uh, seen a lot of interest is inventory control. So the assumption that uh, attaining better forecasting accuracy translates into inventory savings is uh, qu quite often a bit suspect. It's not a one to one correlation, uh, positive correlation that one would lead to the other. So uh, we need to also assess the utility of the forecasts, is what I'm trying to say. And how to do that in the demand uh, uh, context is not straightforward. So I'm going to close with uh, ne uh, some next steps for future research uh, characterization of the demand distributions, proposing of alternative accuracy measures, or adapting existing ones that can deal with intricacies of net demand forecasting. We've made an application to uh, IIF for the IIF SAS grant uh, with uh, uh, John Boylan and Arsene Tetos to investigate these two things. And further, how could quality forecast be, be used to incorporate? To, how could quality forecast be incorporated into forecast of returns or net demand? Uh, maybe some different classes can be can can come out of this. Uh, in the sense that uh, maybe you're going to forecast how many manufacturable returns I have, and then how many repurposable returns they have based on some quality bonds. And of course, there are some hi hierarchies there that could be exploited. And finally, we have some classification methods for uh, demand, normal demand. How could this be expanded or adapted to uh, characterize uh, returns or net demand or to classify it? And here are some uh, uh, references. Um, yeah, and this is it. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Very hard to answer now, or you can email me. But thank you very much for the for the invitation and the opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Thanos. Uh, so the next part now we're moving to uh, discussion. So Robert, we've asked Robert Files uh, to provide some uh, thoughts, feedback, and so on. So Robert, over to you. Um, Thanos, first, th thank you. It's a very interesting talk and a very interesting and increasingly important subject, as you as you made clear. And I suppose my first thought in uh, both looking at your slides and listening to you is essentially the generality of your the setup you've analysed. So um, I'll explain what I mean and then pass it over to you to comment because. Um, and in a sense, it gets into some of the rather more technical issues about how you uh, estimate the uh, the net demand. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a very specific setup, very intermittent in the overall uh, demand, and the, therefore the net returns are also fairly intermittent. Uh, but of course, this is not necessarily a typical situation. Uh, you can have, um, and I'm a, a, a user for better or worse of HP Smart, the, uh, which is, a, I think, a standard example of this, where effectively 
the uh, the ink, the printer printer's ink, uh, when emptied, are returned uh, some of the time uh, to um, uh, HP. So here you've got you know, pretty big demand and mm -hmm. pretty large. So is that a more typical situation? Um, secondly, uh, in your situation, you do have the serial uh, returns. Is that uh, uh, a standard situation? Um, what's wh how? What's the uh, the reliability of those serial codes as they pass through the system? Uh, I mean, you cast doubt on the usefulness of it, but you can certainly uh, uh, understand situations where it might be very useful, uh, and likewise, and you're possibly um, in the defence industry where uh, you have uh, a closer uh, connection between the uh, product and the demand, but there will be others where the connection is very tenuous. So the question to you then is looking more broadly at the problem, um, where, where do you see the differences as lying between your specific case study and the general uh, uh, circular uh, supply chain? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Robert. This is, of course, a, a fantastic question and very uh, interesting and very pertinent to the problem as well. So I, I would I would say that in general there is a movement towards uh, serialization, regardless of its benefits to forecasting returns or not. Uh, we have some um, some um, initiatives in the European Union, the digital passports of products. That uh, I mean, every product needs to have a QR code now that leads back to um, a, a table, a standardized table that presents information about the product. Uh, of course, very close to your question is the, the value of the product we are discussing. So for a inter cartridge, a printer cartridge, maybe it's not as uh, valuable, the, the, the vessel of it. And perhaps that means there's less incentives to uh, have a serialized information on it. Uh, but for instance, uh, cars, all the all, all car parts would have uh, uh, would be barcoded, would have QR codes or, or or even RFID tags. So gearboxes, uh, drivetrains, uh, some assemblies in general, they would have this information, and uh, I increasingly are being tracked at the point of sale, but also at the point of return or the at the factory or the um, garage that they are being uh, tinkered with. Um, in terms of uh, the the characteristics of the demand and the time to return and essentially the return distribution, so as you mentioned, uh, some or, or well, most of our time series were intermittent. Uh, now, I, I do not. I'm not sure. I agree with the um, thought that intermittent demand leads to intermittent net demand. Um, Intermittency drops when you go from demand to net demand. Yeah, um, I heard you make that remark. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so in that sense, maybe. Well, that's a point anyway. But uh, three of the type series were 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 fast. We've seen benefits for both uh, intermittent and fast items. So the benefits are there for both cases. And then goes kind of collapses back to the question of how uh, important or how expensive the item is. What is the value of it? Obviously, the more the value. The more the benefits in 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 uh, controlling the uncertainties uh, uh, better, and, and uh, yeah, so I think I've covered most of the of the parts. I'm not I'm not sure if I if I missed something, but the notes I have here is um, on the generalization, on the reliability of the of the uh, of the setup, intermittence, and the serialization returns, how reliable they are, and how accessible they are, and I think uh, the reliability and the accessibility is going to get better and better. If if for another so reason will remain a, a problem. Now, yeah. re related to that question uh, is the the issue of uh, uh, of aggregation. Mm -hmm. If I understand your estimation methods, they are uh, uh, aggregated effectively over uh, the uh, stews, uh, are they? The results are yes, but we, well, the we results, didn't... but also when you re when you're estimating the parameters, because. Uh, fairly clearly uh, different 
products will have rather different. I mean, you talked about the quality issue, and that's that's related to it. So essentially, you need a a, a method which both uh, deals with individual SKUs, which may be difficult just because of data constraints. But leaving that aside, uh, and then an aggregation method which doesn't. Uh, permit the domination of uh, of large SKUs, which uh, the M5 competition got uh, uh, in the end, although tried hard, still got confused about that uh, that issue. So that that's a general uh, tough question. Now let me ask you uh, a related question: if you if you uh, do regressions on uh, returns on past sales or past yeah, I, I would say sales. What does it what does that look like? So that is uh, that is the, the, that is where the method method to um, relies upon this kind of regressions and correlation analysis of uh, de, de, de returns to past demand. Uh, it, it's it's uh, not as good as as obviously having the actual uh, information available available to you. Uh, but I also wanted to touch on the issue of of, of, of aggregation in our research. We didn't, um, which is a fantastic question and and also very interesting for me as well to explore. Uh, these are products of a kind of a common product family, so you would expect aggregating it and analyzing it would give some useful insights. Of course, there's more information if you look at the individual SKUs. I just want to mention that in our research, uh, we looked at individual SKUs and we fitted distributions on each uh, different one SKU in, uh, individually and then just aggregated uh, the results. So we haven't. So we did the other thing of the two things you mentioned. So we didn't do the aggregation and then uh, doing the anal analysis. Uh, we just did it on the individual SKU basis. Uh, one by one, we fitted the distributions, updated the parameters, and created forecasts based on that. Well, you've obviously got a problem, uh, potentially at least, with using mean absolute error there, haven't you? For sure, for sure, for sure. But uh, uh, that is why in most of the results we use the MACE. But in particular, to show uh, the, um, the, 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 the change of the average error between um returns forecasting and then net demand forecasting uh we don't we, we've put caveats in the in the in the paper as well for that but uh, just to show the effect of of demand forecasting and the net demand uh accuracy uh we, we, we thought that that was the best way to do it it's not ideal uh and and of course you're right i mean you do have a natural relative error measure there don't you um so you can always overcome some of those difficulties, although the, the issue of negative values needs to be yeah. thought through, certainly. Mm. Anyway, uh, again, thank you for that interesting talk. Oh, just one final point. Um, yes. you, di you didn't really discuss, uh, although you, it's sort of touched on on the slide, uh, the lead time effects uh, uh -huh. and how that affects both the forecasting and the results. No, I don't, I don't think we, we, we we presented any results on that. We have some results. I'm, I'm happy to have a look and, and share it with you. No, but, it's OK, but yeah, it, yeah. it's obviously an issue because uh, uh, the uh, you are actually concerned probably with uh, uh, longer lead times or possibly even cumulative sales, uh, cumulative net sales and things like that. So you, yeah. uh, in, uh, an issue to consider and uh, to analyze. Yeah. It's important, especially also important in relation with the average time to return. So how many of the past periods contribute returns to your lead time is very yes, important. Okay. I also wanted to, to to mention that back in back, back when we were doing this project, uh, Robert, we, we, we contacted you and we got a very nice uh, student, student dissertation from Lancaster that had actually employed these uh, four methods from Ken and Silver, which really helped us. And uh, I just want to mention <laughs> that and help you. Oh, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So just as some someone did a, a, a dissertation uh, with a company through Lancaster. It was a fantastic dissertation, actually. Right. Good. Uh, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Robert, for your comments. Thanks, Thanos, for replies. If we have any questions from the audience, then please raise your hand and I'll uh, uh, allow you, well, allow you to unmute yourself and show the video. Uh, I actually have a, a question. So. It looks to me that one of the possible solutions to this would be to use some sort of multivariate model, like vector autoregressive or something like that, because returns would be related to the demand, and you know it should be lagged structure, at least from my understanding of the problem. So, have you thought of uh, using anything like that? 
I think this is what essentially what we used. Uh, this are uh, delayed, yeah. delayed lag models, basically, that uh, try to estimate the distribution. This is the distribution and it's a delayed lag model in effect, mm. in effect yeah. Yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, because I've never worked with those models, so that's why I'm yeah. Um, and uh, it, I'm not also not sure I haven't worked in this area, but time to return when you're trying to select the distribution. Uh, something tells me that from statistical point of view, exponential distribution might uh, be appropriate, but I, I'm not sure if that's that's the case. Have you investigated that? I, I think we did, and we, we found that it wasn't very a very good fit. But I'm I'm happy to go back and and, and check. I mean, we did test uh, uh, many many distributions, mm, uh, okay. and we didn't know it's so easy to do it. Right. Well, as you see, a bit of technical questions uh, and so, sort of a recommendation, uh, I guess. If you are considering something like intermittent demand, what I find sometimes useful is to add uh, zero forecast just for the reference you know typically yeah. it's, it's not a, a good forecast zero forecast but if it wins in terms of yes, yeah. measures then it's a bad sign. Yeah. Yeah, often does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah but also again in this uh in this setting there are not as many zeros in the net demand as there are in the in the demand uh, so sorry just uh, robert a, a weighted average is that the same as as as, as subtracting one from another it's, it's sure. not the same. Sure. is it okay mm -hmm. Right. I guess we are running out of time. So thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Anas, thank you. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much right, for thank coming you, thank and joining you. us. Bye. Uh, all right. See you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye. And thank you. Dash as well. Bye. <laughs> Cheers.